Cashamaniacs. Gearheads. Yeah, that's right. It, this is the Geo Gearheads again. Our 80th. Yeah, man, I'm uh, already messing up today. So let's try that again. That's right. This is the Geo Gearheads, our 80th installment. I'm Daryl W4, back with a bad cop today, and we'll be talking about premium features at geocaching.com. This isn't going to be a very deep show, but more quick look at the features as a reminder of what premium members have access to that like the basic members don't, and maybe to give you some ideas about how to use some of those features better. As usual, though, we have a few things to talk about before we get into the topic. Well, Daryl, I have to say to you, happy 7-Eleven Day. If you didn't know, all 7-Eleven locations give out free 7.11-ounce Slurpees on this day every year. Yeah, I got my uh, free Slurpee. Uh, it's my first, actually, in something like three years. You know, I missed it this year, so I guess I'm going to have to wait another 365 days for a Slurpee. Well, I used to love those things, but after having one today, I kind of wonder why, so you didn't miss too much. <laughs> uh, a quick note about a service, though, that we mentioned last week. Uh, Google Latitude is actually going to be retired on August 9th. Uh, we'll include a link in the uh, show notes, but Google will be rolling some of that uh, functionality into uh, Google Plus and actually into the uh, Maps app as well. So uh, that's one of those uh, uh, services we mentioned that you can actually cross off the list now. <laughs> one less thing to sign up for. But exactly. we'll, see how, we'll see how that works in their new apps. Next week, we're back with Rich Owings of GPS track log to talk about the current crop of GPSRs and what might just be coming down the road. Then the week after that, we'll have another randomized edition. We've been covering a bunch of topics lately, and we've heard from many listeners about things from Munzees to Wallaby. So it's a great time to get your comments, any burning questions, tips, tricks, or just about any feedback to us. Remember, randomized shows are driven from your questions. And by some of the stuff that we have left over from the last one. Well, there uh, we go. do love sharing that feedback, uh, it, especially when it's in your own voice. And there's a couple of ways that you can do that. The easiest is just call our voicemail line at 206-350-3647 and leave us a message. Better yet, though, is to record that as an audio file on something like your smartphone and email it to geogearheads at cashmaniacs.com. Of course, you can always type that up and email it to us uh, at that same address or get in touch with us through uh, social networks like Google+. Well, I may have to wait a year for a free Slurpee, but I don't have to wait anymore for Munzee 2.0. They released it for iOS today. And boy, what a different look. You know, I like it. It, it looks a lot more mature. Yeah, I did actually get out and try it today. I uh, deployed a few new Munzees uh, since there weren't any close enough for me to actually hit and uh, still get back in time to do the show. It, it's got some bugs and hints at future features, but really it looks like they've been taking some uh, design cues from Google. And hasn't everybody lately? <laughs> I think even iOS has taken some design cues from Google. Now, one of the things is, can you believe they finally added a compass? Yeah, uh, but you know, we'll talk more about uh, Munzee uh, later on. For you know, save it for a Munzee show. Tonight, we wanted to talk about those uh, premium member features, and really, what we're looking at here is just you know, kind of a quick overview, so get, kind of get a feel for what some of those features are, how they can be used, and uh, you know, a lot of us have been premium members and kind of forget what the basic members don't get with their membership and what we do and take advantage of and quite frankly take for granted. So that's what we're going to cover today and we've already mentioned it in uh, some of the past shows but it's ten dollars for a reoccurring three-month subscription if you want to do that or thirty dollars a year and that can be one time or uh, auto renewing if you want 
Plus, if you have the at least the iPhone app, I haven't gotten around to check on Android, but on the iOS app, you can actually go and do that as an in-app purchase for the $30 as well. So a couple of different uh, ways that you can do that. Well, let's go down and kind of talk about these uh, point for point, and we'll start with the uh, instant notifications. Do you want to talk a little bit about that, Bad Cop? Yeah, sure. Now, I use instant notifications for new caches, when a new cache is published. Um, I've also used them in the past for uh, archived caches or once I played with it just to see what would happen to f see if when caches around me were found. I quickly turned that one off. That was way too much information too quickly. <laughs> But yeah, and one of the interesting things too, they and uh, they've changed that whole notification system since I first signed on, and I really do like the new one much better. But you can actually pick different locations and different radiuses and have multiple mm -hmm. set up. Go, you know, multiple. You know, like let's say you go have a uh, cottage or a vacation home that you go to. You can set up one set of uh, notifications for. Uh, first to find uh, opportunities there you know, for the publishers there and one for home and turn them on and off as needed. But you can also say, I only want the traditionals or I only want the new puzzle caches. Or you know, because you can set up those multiples with the multiple ranges, you can say, okay, for the traditionals, I only want the ones that are within five miles because I know that anything more than that, someone else is going to beat me to it. Exactly. But when it comes to a puzzle cache, I want to go out like 25 miles. Yeah, exactly. And um, so those can be sent to email. You can send them to your phone. You know, a lot of, I know uh, any premium member has the new cash listings automatically sent to their phone. I used to go out 10 miles, found out anything beyond six, I really can't get an FTF on. So I lowered that down to six. And, you know, there have been a couple in the last week. Well, that's pretty cool. I, yeah, so, I, I don't really uh, do a whole lot with it. Yeah, it, it's it, it got to the point where when I was getting them, mm -hmm. it kind of actually started uh, ruling the life for a little while too. But yeah, that's not the point <laughs> so much as it, the whole thing was when we used to go out and do those uh, uh, first to find hunts. It was all about meeting the other cashers, and when exactly. gas prices started getting a little bit uh, higher. Mm -hmm. people stopped going for those uh, caches as much. So the group that we always used to run into never showed up. Maybe you'd get uh, one or two people. And the newer cashers that were getting into the first finds just didn't really hang around for those parties. And I think a lot of that was actually you would get like four or five posts at a time or publishes at a time, sometimes more. So it wasn't that, you know, oh, there's a new cache published. It's now there are new caches published, and you go for all of them. Yeah, yeah. Now, at one time, uh, with an older version of GSAC, I was using the instant notifications to receive uh, uh, documents and email of archived caches and allowed uh, GSAC to, to process those and remove those out of my database. So that was one of the things that, you know, show me all the archived caches, and as soon as they're archived, they're, I'm sent an email, and it worked out really well, but with the live API, that's no longer an issue. Right, right. Now, here's another you know, interesting tidbit that we'll throw in. For anyone who has the Caches app on iOS, one of the cool things that it does is push notifications using this feature. So what you have it do is give you an email address that you then activate at geocaching.com and send your notifications to that email address, then that uh, email address pushes a notification to your phone saying that a new cache is published and loads it right into the uh, caches app. So that's an interesting way, and it, I don't really use the caches app, but I keep it on the phone in part so that I can look at it and review it. But it's great for those uh, notifications because it's just you know standard notification. I pull down the notification, go right to it, and there it is. You, know, you can set up the uh, text messages uh, by email. You can set up uh, some of the other services that will do push notifications through whatever means you want. You can just have you know, a push email sent. But what's so cool about doing it that way is it will actually just open the cache right on the phone. 
Exactly. And, uh, you know, there, there are many different ways to do it. I didn't know about the push notifi notifications with Cash's app. I like that. I'm going to have to go try that. Yeah, it is a uh, uh, like two or three dollar app, and for that, uh, you know, one feature, it's worth it to me. But it's not one that I would really want to use to find apps or to find caches. I still prefer Geosphere, and I really hope that uh, some of the other guys take their cues from that. But even better, I hope that eventually the uh, geocaching.com live API will somehow support notifications so that we could do it in all of the apps without having to go through email. Right. That would be a nice touch. But, you know, hey, there's still room to grow, right? Exactly. Well, let's move on to uh, pocket queries. And we've talked about these in so many different ways. And this is, uh, in part, the basis for a lot of the other features as well. Uh, they're now kind of calling them uh, custom searches. But we'll always know and love them as uh, pocket queries. <laughs> The, the the thing, though, is with those pocket queries, we've talked about this uh, before where we're going to set those up and not actually execute them. Well, yes. pocket queries really is just that downloadable GPX file, so it probably is more accurate to uh, refer to these as the custom searches because we can do so much more with it. And we were just talking about those uh, FTF opportunities, mm -hmm. and one of the things that I like to do is set up a pocket query that never gets run that's just show me all the FTF options, you know, the unfound caches. Unfound caches, exactly. And I never actually run that. Mm -hmm. It just sits there, and when I want to see what those uh, caches are, I just hit the preview button, and wow, there it is. You know, I can see if the caches have been found or not. Well, and the problem with that is you rely on the cacher to actually log it, and sometimes they don't log it for a day or two, and you're still not going to get the blank log, but you know it, it's a good way to uh, get a good, quick idea of what's uh, open. You may not be first to find, but you could be first to log, and that's something. <laughs> yeah, that is, I guess. <laughs> now, it's there not are, worth the bragging rights. No, not the same. Now, there are some limits to these pocket queries. The first one is only five per day. So I just looked on my uh, geocaching.com account, and I have 44 pocket queries. Uh, you know, I can so, believe that. Yeah, so I've got them set up. Uh, you know, you set them up for everything. I vacation over here. My brother lives in this town. You know, I want all these available. I took the time to set them up. I'm going to keep them. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and you can set those up for uh, things like the caches along a route and for lists, which we'll talk yeah. about in a little while. And you'll set those up once and just have them there so that you can turn them on and off as needed rather than have to go and reset up your file. But one of the things that uh, we should probably note is that five uh, per day is the actual generation of that GPX, mm -hmm. not... Uh, uh, just you know, running. You can preview those as many times as you want. Exactly. It's only when it's going to generate that that it counts against that five per day. Right. So when it generates it and runs it, and you know, I, I sound old. Let me tell you something, Sonny. I remember the day when you had to set your pocket queries to run the day ahead of time because they didn't generate automatically. And now they, they generate and run, you know, Within minutes, so. Well, yeah, I don't think it wasn't that they were not generating automatically. It's that they had such a slow machine that, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't uh, really keep up with everything. <laughs> now they yeah. they did a whole bunch of uh, infrastructure updates and server upgrades, and yeah, they have. You know, that used to be its own little machine that ran that uh, pocket query. And so now it's great. You know, there's some slowdowns uh, usually first thing in the morning when the uh, um, you know time switches over and it starts processing all of these daily files and things. But uh, most of the time, if I want a uh, pocket query, you know, I can get it uh, within you know 20, 30 minutes if it if I just create it and tell it delete the uh, pocket query. It runs a lot uh, uh, quicker. It does. It does. So. You know, they're, they're, I consider them almost instantaneous anymore. Another limitation is the number of caches you can have per pocket query. Right now, it's 1,000. Used to be 500, and again, I'm sounding old, aren't I? So, 1,000 yeah. caches, and you, have to, you can set the number you want to run. Uh, 
make sure you're when you uh, do a pocket query and you're doing it for a specific device that it can handle a thousand caches. Any of the newer GPS is not an issue, but some of the older Etrex versions that uh, that wouldn't handle more than 500. Yeah, yeah. Well, and an interesting point as well. If you're only going to do 500 or fewer caches, it will actually allow you to, uh, or I shouldn't say allow you, but when it sends that email telling you that the uh, uh, caches are, uh, your pocket query is run, it will actually have the GPX file attached. If you're doing anything over 500, so 501, <laughs> then it's only going to be stored online, and you have to go and actually download it through a web browser or through, like, the uh, API access. So if you're doing uh, the apps, the 1,000 isn't going to be any problem, and p pulling it from the API isn't going to be a problem. So, yeah, that's uh, nice and handy. But if you're looking for something a little bit quicker and easier, especially if you're on, like, a slower connection, if you can keep it down to 500 or less, that's going to improve the transfer time, plus it will go over email, which generally uh, is a little bit more forgiving about uh, timeouts on the uh, file downloads than is like web browser. That's true. And uh, I was running a GSAC macro that would look through my email for the specific titles, pull those out, and process the, uh, the caches, the GPX files for me. So it was a really nice, slick little tool. I got, yeah. I have to admit, I got a little annoyed when they stopped sending or when they increased it to 1,000 and didn't send it by email. I have to go download it? That seems like work. Yeah, well, <laughs> and that's the other thing, is there are uh, uh, people who have done automation where it will take those GPX files and move it to something like their Dropbox so it's available on all their devices. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can do that kind of stuff through the API you know, to get it onto the uh, uh, devices if you need to, but it, it is nice to have the option of that automation. So if that's what you want to do, that threshold is 500, with one exception, and that's the My Finds Pocket Query. This is a very, very cool, useful tool. Badcap, why don't I let you start off with this? Well, the My Finds Pocket Query gives you a pocket query, a list, a GPX file, of all the caches that you have found. This is great to load into GSAC and run queries against for uh, challenges. Have you met, you know, challenges in counties or a specific area? Well, just any of the challenges. There's there's a GSAC macro that's going to help you process that and make it easier. Yeah, there, and one of the ways that I like to use it is to load into my uh, Geosphere is its own little group, so I can just turn it off and not have it processed. But by loading it in there and telling it to show the active caches, it gives me a good method to figure out where I can go and place new caches. So that's something to uh, uh, keep in mind if you have a you know, smartphone or something like that that can hold a lot of caches and do some, you know, some more filtering. Yeah, I haven't found a GPS yet that will handle that well, especially if, when you've got as many cache finds as I do, which is well over 5,000. That's just a lot for those to uh, process, and you get so much extra junk in the uh, GPS. So exactly. I do know some people who will load those in as POIs, however, mm -hmm. and at that point, again, it's there as the reference. If you need it, it's great to have when you're looking to uh, publish uh, new caches, you know, to hide a cache in a uh, location that you think might have had one before but don't know for sure. And how many times have you gone out with somebody else and said, oh, yeah, there's that cache over there. I can't yeah. remember the name of it, and I don't remember exactly where it was hidden, but I know it's over there. Yeah, and one of the uh, things that uh, I should mention as well uh, with the way that I handle my geosphere, and this is a tip for anyone who does it, I do not clear out my logs or my uh, caches until I have a new... Uh, my finds pocket query loaded in because that way it will keep all of my uh, extra waypoints and stuff that I've kept for a cache. So again, if you're looking at it as reference when someone has a problem or if you're looking at it for, you know, can I place a new cache here? That's going to be really important to have that information. So 
you know, that those extra waypoints aren't going to be saved in the My Finance Pocket Query, but if you're using something like uh, GSAC or um, Geosphere, make sure that you load that in before you kill any of those uh, caches in those uh, groups because it will kill all of that extra information when you do it. Exactly. So let it update the, uh, the geocache rather than rebuild it, and you keep all that information. Right, right. Uh, and then why don't we move on to uh, caches along a route, which we yep. uh, talked about in detail. So we'll just skim over this uh, real quick, and that's uh, the ability to create your own uh, routes through the online mapping tool. You can upload a GPX or KML file. You can download a GPX file. And you can also do things like find an existing route, like we talked about before, Route 66, or those uh, hike bike trails. That's right. And those you can easily save to a uh, pocket query and run them later. Right. And we actually use the routes and the pocket queries a lot for filtering what we're going to do uh, unlike on a, a trip, you know, driving, vacation, whatever, uh, we just, you know, we don't actually create the pocket query. We create that search, kind of like we were talking about before, and then mm -hmm. go through it and manually tag those as lists. And that's the next thing that we want to talk about is the lists option. And there's actually three different list types. They have the bookmark list, the ignore, and the favorites. And the bookmark lists are the ones that probably are going to be the most interesting. And that exactly. is you get uh, the ability to go bookmark a cache, say hey, this is something I like. You can create a public bookmark list, you know, shared bookmark where people can look for it and find it and you know, see what you've got on that. Great for doing uh, like series of caches. You can put together a bookmark list, flag it, and then anyone, as long as that's a, a shared bookmark list, can go and create their own pocket query of all of those caches in that series. So that makes it really, really handy. You can also do your own like mini geo tour. Uh, people have been doing this for years where you go through and mark, these are some caches that you really must hit in this area. Share that and let everyone know. But the one that I'm talking about with using the uh, caches along a route is simply you do the search, you go and say, okay, no, you know, this one's close, but not easily accessible, so let me scroll up here. Ah, oh, this is at the rest area. Tap on that, bookmark that uh, cache into the caches I'm going to find on my way to grandmother's house. And then when you're done, you take that bookmark list, create your pocket query, transfer it to your GPS, and you're not uh, staring at all of those caches going by. But it's a cache we could grab. I want to grab the cache. No, but it's six miles round trip to get there and back back to the freeway again. It's uh, it's not practical. <laughs> yeah, and those uh, yeah, uh, terrain at, five caches yeah, that you exactly. have to go repelling, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, the, it, so it is a really nice feature mm -hmm. to uh, have. It takes a little bit more time planning, uh, and we'll probably talk about that uh, again at some point in the future. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it, it's a nice way to go to kind of cherry pick the caches that you want. Yeah, and, and that could be something completely unrelated. If you wanted to go and set up a power cache run where you only wanted to do these caches and omit anyone, you know, you can do it that way. But you can also do the ignore list, which when you're doing that pocket query setup, there's an option to not include caches that are on that ignore list. Mm -hmm. So you just go into the cache, hit ignore, and then you won't, you know, for all practical purposes, ever see that cache again. Right. Well, so if it's one that's got a lot of problems or if it's one that just frustrated you because you can't figure out how to solve it, <laughs> you can hit ignore and it never shows up again. Within a mile of my house, I have a scuba cache. And it, it annoyed me that it was the closest unfound cache. It's like, no, I just, I'm going to put that on the ignore list. I'm not going to go scuba diving to get a cache. I'm, you know, I've never done scuba diving. I'm not going to go get certified for one stinking cache. <laughs> <laughs> so you I just put it on the ignore find list. Find someone to work with. Yeah, that's true. I I should do that, and then I could take it off the ignore list, mark it as a found, and move on. Exactly. No, no, it's dead to me. <laughs> <laughs> that cache is dead to me. So yeah, I, we have a few caches that uh, we had uh, uh, flagged as ignore because they had issues of one type or another, whether they were uh, mm -hmm. 
in areas they shouldn't have been or uh, had problems with this, that, or the next thing. We just didn't want to do them, so we mark them as ignore. I know people who take certain cache hiders and put them on an ignore list. They never want to find their caches. I'm not one of those people. I, you know, I will ignore a cache you know, equally among hiders. <laughs> All righty. Uh, so let's move out of the uh, list because I think we've uh, kind of covered that. Although we should probably mention those favorites uh, kind of quickly because yeah. only premium members can apply favorites to caches. And it really it's kind of like a bookmark list again, but all it is is your favorites. So it, it's basically just, you know, you create a list of your uh, favorite caches as you go and favorite a cache, which is a very cool option, I do have to admit. I but really like not, it. I use it a lot. Yeah, it's not uh, going to do you a whole lot of good to have that favorite list because you've already found the caches. Right. But it's uh, it's a nice thing to have uh, if you ever had to go back and say, oh, well, what were the best caches in this area? You can go back and look at that favorites list. You can also reclaim favorite points for things like, you know, caches that uh, were updated and got to be really icky because, like, the great camo job <laughs> turned into, you know, like a film can under a lamp skirt all of a sudden. Right. <laughs> or the cache has been archived. Yeah, exactly. I, I don't like to pull my favorite points. I, I I'm a little either. bit uh, uh, more judicious with my uh, favorite points. I got plenty of favorite points sitting around. But... I yeah. I, I like to have that history and show that that cache was a really good cache, so I don't like to pull my favorite points from archived caches. I don't. In fact, I have favored archived caches. I've favorited. Yeah, favorited. It, caches. It's one of um, those weird words that shouldn't yeah. exist. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, when favorite points came along, I was like, you know, this is one of my favorite caches. I'm going to go put a favorite point on it. Yeah. Even yeah. though it's been archived. Now, Another feature, because, you know, these are all features of being a premium member of geocaching.com, are the premium caches. These are caches that don't show up to basic members. You have to be a premium member to even... Uh, no, you can get information about it, can't you? No, you can't. You can't no, get you any can't. information about it. Yeah, yeah. That's right. That, the thing about the premium caches is they are only accessible to the premium members, but when you flag it as premium only, as the cache owner you also get additional information like the audit log so you can see which users have viewed that cache and how many times they viewed it. Yes. So if you're going to do that for a puzzle cache, that's a lot of fun to see who keeps coming back to the page and can't quite figure it out. Yeah, now these premium-only caches uh, tend to annoy a lot of users, mm -hmm. but... The way that I've generally seen it done is if you have a cache in a more sensitive location, you want to, a lot of the times, mark that as a premium-only cache so that you don't have people who are less experienced going in. And there are some back doors, so most of the people I know who have done the uh, uh, premium-only caches will work with uh, other cachers who aren't mm -hmm. premium members to let them log the cache either through the back door or whatever. So there are ways around it, but that's the most common way that I've seen people do that. However, I have heard people who do those premium-only caches because they want that auto log or, or uh, audit log. So if they have a really tough puzzle cache and they think people are cheating, they'll go, ooh, well, this person didn't log in and get that information. Right. Well, it, here's the problem with those audit logs. That's not really going to help you that much anymore with the uh, GPX files and the paperless caching. You can get most of that information without hitting the web page. Exactly. But, you know, hey, we had a cache thief around here. So a lot of the local cachers went and tagged their caches premium uh, member caches because they figured if somebody is logging into geocaching.com trying to you know, just get information to go out and steal a cache, they're probably not going to pay $30 a year to do that. Yeah, yeah, that's another good way to do it. Another reason why, you know, sensitive areas, yeah. you know, people are putting in premium-only caches. And, well, 
the reason that's a sensitive area is because it's high theft rate. So bingo, <laughs> another another one of those situations. But yeah, there's a lot of uh, people who will put the caches you know, in uh, nature centers or something, and it's like real obvious that it's supposed to be in this tree. But if you're not an experienced cacher, mm-hmm. you, know, you could have the you know, especially under that uh, canopy, you know, you can have people running around with their phones that aren't getting a good enough signal and go traipsing through this uh, wetland where there's one nice little path that's uh, been created for like the uh, keepers or the you know, rangers right. or whatever that leads right to this tree and these other people are going and tromping around and destroying the uh, landscapes so you know, it, it's a way to discourage that from happening well I always say geocaching is a contact sport if you're doing it right <laughs> now all right <laughs> Another uh, feature of being a premium member is stats. And again, I'm, I'm sounding old here. I remember the days when that wasn't on geocaching.com. It was a third, hosted on a third-party site. Or well, and there are still GSAC some that plugin. are third-party. That's true. There are. Um, and you still have those GSAC plugins, too. But for the most part, I'm really happy with the stats on the geocaching page. Yeah, and the nice thing about the stats is it, it's a fairly basic set of stats as far mm-hmm. as what you can get. You know, there's so many other uh, places that you can go and get a lot more information, including like GSAC and uh, uh, I can't remember the name of the app, but uh, Mac Defender was the uh, uh, you know, author's company's name, uh, which is in Linux, uh, iOS, or no, not iOS, uh, Linux. Uh, Windows and Mac OS, I think, uh, app that just takes your MyFind Pocket Query. And again, that's why you want that MyFind's Pocket Query mm-hmm. and choose through it and gives you all kinds of great information. GSEC does the same kind of stuff, but uh, uh, this app from Mac Defender is free and does a very good job, as I recall. Haven't used it in over a year because, well, the built-in stats do you know, a good enough job for almost anything that I want. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, they're not perfect, but they're they're good enough. Yeah, definitely. Um, do we want to go over any of the details or want to leave that for another show? No, we'll leave that for another show because uh, we are already uh, uh, running a little long and we still have a few more issues. You know, we wanted to make this a shorter show again because we've been going along <laughs> the last uh, several shows. So why don't we move on to the advanced maps? And this is one big reason that a lot of people I know Mm-hmm. went and paid their $30 because they got so annoyed when the Google Maps went away. And the only way to get the Google Maps again is to be a premium member. Exactly. That's not because they want to necessarily encourage you to be a premium member, but they have to pay for those maps. They're no longer free access. So the way that they were able to uh, make the Google Maps come back is to only offer them to the people who have the paid memberships because they got to pay that bill to Google. So, you know, that's how they take care of that. Exactly. So you've got the um, Google Maps, which again, as you said, only premium members. And you have filters that you can put on those maps. You can filter by types uh, and by groups of types. And whether you found it or not. There you go. So again, you know, if it's not a long trip, If it's going to be a shorter trip, I'll sometimes just pop in the maps and do my bookmarking right there. Just, you know, show me all the uh, caches I haven't found that are traditionals and just tap, tap, tap. You know, it's a little uh, little bit more work, but if I already know the route and it's not that long, it means I don't have to generate the route and the finds and everything. And it's a quick way for me to go and do a pocket query. You know, the perfect example is like, what are the caches I can do to and from this event? Okay, right. tap, tap, tap. Okay, now I have the six caches I want to do on my way to the event in this list that I can go and download to my iPhone. Bingo. And, and talking about the iPhone, yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about the uh, live API limits. Now, we've kind of mentioned it on some of the other shows, uh, especially on the uh, Geosphere show, that basic users only get full access to three caches a day. Three traditional geocaches. Good, yeah, good point. Three traditional geocaches per day. As of now, when you're a premium member, you get 6,000 full geocache lookups per day. And you get 10,000 partial lookups. 
Right. So that's a whole lot better than what you can get as a uh, basic member. And that's the difference between something like Geosphere or Neon Geo being usable. Exactly. You know, that 6,000 full geocache look up today, it's like 5,000 cache pocket queries plus a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> here's, here's one thing to uh, remember, though, too, is depending on how the app works, you can burn through multiples as you go and, like, pan around on the map or whatever. You know, it depends on how, what your settings are mm -hmm. and how the app is handling it. So there are some concerns over uh, uh, that usage. But even then, think about how many caches you'd have to look at, even if it had to do it like four or five times. You're still talking over a thousand caches that you'd have to hit. Exactly. And I've never hit the limit. I don't know what I've done. I, you know, I don't, I don't see a counter, but I know I've never hit the limit. Yeah, well, one browser. of the nice things is that uh, Geosphere, now, you know, now that it supports the API, does it actually give you that counter? And I thought a couple of the uh, Android apps did as well, but you know, I can't think of what those were and how they happened. Now i got to go look. Yeah. Now, I, we do have a, a question in the Google Plus Hangout uh, from uh, uh, Corey, and he said, basic members get access to only three caches? Yeah, through the API, you only get access to three uh, traditional caches for the full information. You do get partial information for more, mm -hmm. but I'm not finding good documentation on what that is, so I don't want to quote anything. I want to say it was only like 100 now, but I don't know for sure what that limit is. Bad Cop, though, you found out that through the official app, you can get around that, so that's a good reason. Exactly. If you're, if you're not going to have the uh, premium membership, then you might want to stick with the official geocaching app because it's going to give you more information without paying that $30 a month. Or a right. year, sorry. $30 a year. There you go. That's yeah. uh, $3 a month or you know $10 for three months. Um, but I'm thinking the you know three traditional geocaches sounds an awful lot like the geocaching intro app that'll give you the three closest uh, geocaches to you and allow you yeah. to go find those. So. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, but yeah, it, as I recall, when we talked with the uh, guys over at Groundspeak about the API, and that was before they made a lot of these uh, changes, it really was designed uh, to get uh, uh, you know a taste of what people could do with the premium membership, or for the people who are just out. You know, hey, I want to find a cache while I'm you know in Boston for my meeting today. Right. So, you know, it's a good way to get, you know, the one or two caches for the casual cacher. But, you know, if you're going to be a more serious cacher, you're going to want that uh, $30 a year to get this full-featured uh, uh, API access. You get the pocket queries, the stats, the lists, you know, the caches along a route. And if you're a first-to-find hound, you can't do that without those instant notifications. Exactly. And the stats. Yeah, well, I, I already mentioned the stats, but I, I have the feeling you're uh, more into the stats than I am. What are you saying about the stats? There's nothing wrong with stats. It's all about the numbers. Yeah, I was just going to say you're, you're one of those <laughs> about the numbers guys. No, I'm not. No, it, no. It's about neither one of us is. Yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, it's, uh, it depends on how you're caching, but uh, it, it really does uh, make a difference to mm -hmm. have the uh, premium membership in we do know a lot of people who have skipped the premium membership. They only have like one in the household and that kind of stuff. So there are some options to kind of ease it, but don't forget you're also helping to support the uh, geocaching.com site. And if you want to keep that running, uh, they can uh, certainly use that money, but uh, yeah, it, it's, it's a nice set of features to have. And without it, it, you know, geocaching would be much, much harder. It would be. It would be. I've told you a couple of times that I let my subscription lapse for a time period so that it would line up with my birthday. And I found caching hard, or, or let's say it was more difficult during that time, not having all those uh, amenities that I had gotten used to. 
Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, and we do have a couple of questions in the uh, uh, Google Plus post again um, about those API limits. And again, the premium uh, limits are 6,000 full geocaches, that's with mm -hmm. the descriptions and everything, or 10,000 partials. So it, a good point when we were talking with the uh, uh, developer of Geosphere was he mentioned that they're doing... Uh, the partials for a lot of the preview information so that it doesn't need to have it and just to get some updates. You know, there's all kinds of ways that you can leverage that. So essentially, you're getting 16,000 queries a day, even though you might not uh, get all of them at the uh, uh, same time doing the same thing, you know, blah, blah, okay. blah. Nice. And we do have a listener who said he's hit his limit a couple of times as a... Uh you know, hit his 6,000 full caches a day limit as he was looking for uh, uh, caches that would meet the fizzy challenge. Yeah, and uh, Nighthawk700 said, uh, get the premium membership, honestly. Uh, there's uh, some stories apparently out there about uh, people who have tried uh, cheating the system. And, you know, we don't really encourage the cheating of the system. But if you have... Right. You know, it, we know a lot of people who have multiple accounts within the family. So each, mm -hmm. you know, each kid has it and that can get a really costly, especially if you're on a budget. So, you know, you might not want it. And, uh, you know, what's really the only thing if you have the, uh, multiple family members like that is the access to the premium members because, or the premium caches, because mm -hmm. you know, everyone's going to be caching together anyway. But, you know, if you can afford to do it, it is nice to have. You know, we had, uh, uh, for a while here, uh, Firefly had her own account. I had my own account, and both of them were premium. And at that point, we were limited to 500 caches. We didn't have caches along a route. So when we wanted to do trips, we had to go and, you know, do all these staggered uh, pocket <laughs> queries to get them. And on several times, we did max out our uh, pocket queries for a day getting mm -hmm. uh, routes with all the caches that we wanted. Of course, we also didn't really know what we were doing as much then. So, <laughs> But no, it, it, it really is very little uh, money for what you're getting. Yeah, mm -hmm. If you're into geocaching, it really is worth it. I mean, Bad Cop, to kind of summarize, you've gone through this uh, uh, for a little while and said that you didn't like it. I mean, what what possible motivation would you have to not do the thirty dollars a year to get it? Um, now nothing, and and as I said, I only let it lapse uh, because I wanted it to line up with my birthday. You know, it was just some random month, and I thought, well, you know, if I just let it go like three or four months, it'll line up with my birthday. And you know, it was one of those things I didn't realize how much I used the caches along a route and the pocket queries. It's like you know, what's in this area? Oh wait, I got to go look. Hold on, I got to go look at a map and figure out what I haven't found yet, <laughs> rather yeah. than just grabbing a pocket query and going. Yeah, and we really did start off talking that uh, you know, in part, this is to remind you what the features are that you get as a premium member. Because I have to remind myself a lot of the time that the new cashers just coming into this, the cashers who are just doing the uh, uh, basic membership and the iPhone app they don't have a lot of these uh, options and I have to really remind myself, oh, that's for premium members only. Right. Exactly. So that's going to do it for uh, tonight's show. Hopefully uh, you got a lot of uh, mm -hmm. uh, reminders, if nothing else, uh, you know, maybe a couple of good ideas along the way. And don't forget that next week we are going to be talking with Rich Owings about the state of GPSRs. So make sure to send us in your questions and comments for that. But even more, the following week, we are going to be having another randomized show. And I love those shows because there are so many cool topics about so many different things. And so much of it comes from you. That's right. Check the Cashomaniacs website at cashomaniacs.com for more on the Geo Gearheads, including show notes from this and all our episodes. We love hearing from you, our listeners. So leave us feedback by calling 206 Three five zero three six four seven by emailing geogearheads at cashamaniacs.com or through social media. 
Your support helps keep the Cash Maniac shows coming. Please consider making a PayPal donation through the link on our website to support the Cash Maniac shows. Geo Gearheads is produced by Chris Umfenauer and Daryl Wattenberg. This show is copyright 2013 by Daryl Wattenberg. All rights reserved. Thank you.